Hello, my name is Rebecca Chung, and I am the director and PI of 21 CSLA State Center. Welcome to our 21 CSLA Research WAC Practice Webinar, Sidelining Bias. 21 CSLA is the 21st Century California School Leadership Academy, and our role is to provide high quality professional learning and support for California's educational leaders, teachers, site, and district leaders, with the goal of creating more equitable learning environments so that ultimately we can improve student success for underserved students. The work of 21 CSLA is guided by an equity statement, which includes the following, leaders for equity transform education to improve access, opportunity, and inclusion for students and adults, especially those who are systemically marginalized and historically underserved so that they can thrive. 21 CSLA is funded by three state agencies, the California Department of Education, the California State Board of Education, and the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. Please join me in observing a land acknowledgement as we do as a regular practice at UC Berkeley. Yate, everyone. Good morning. My name is Brianna Woodson. I'm so happy to be here with you all today. I'm a project specialist on the UTK team um, for the State Center. Um, so I'm actually native. I'm Diné or Navajo from Arizona. And I'm also Little Lake Pomo and Concra Maidu from California, from Mendocino County, our Sonoma Regional Academy. Um, so Today, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Ohlone land. Um, in our active dismantling of the oppressive and erasure effects of colonial structures, we would like to acknowledge that today's 21 CSLA fall collective retreat takes place on the unceded territory, territory of the Mawekma Ohlone peoples. We recognize and honor the continuous presence and living history of indigenous peoples. Yate, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jabari Mahiri, a professor of education at UC Berkeley and chair of the leadership board of 21 CSLA. We welcome you all to our 15th webinar, and we especially are excited to introduce you to our featured speaker, Dr. Jason Akunafwa, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at UC Berkeley he earned his PhD in psychology from Stanford. His research examines social psychological processes that contribute to inequity and specifically racial inequities. For example, he conducted a large scale randomized control trial that showed a scalable virtual program reduced racial disparities in year long suspensions by 45% for a sample of 6,000 students across 20 cities. Another one of his recent interventions significantly cut suspension rates for a sample of 13,210 students. These large scale interventions target the mindsets of people in positions of power, i.e. teachers and administrators, to sideline bias with a more functional focus on empathy to shift the way they interact with the individuals under their supervision, particularly the ones from racially stigmatized groups. His research has been published in top journals, including Science Advances, Psychological Science, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it has received international recognition with a number of prestigious awards, as well as funding from such organizations as and foundations as Google, Tides Foundation, Character Lab, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Findings from his research has also been featured in a variety of popular media outlets, including National Public Radio, the New York Times, NSNBC, Routers, Huffington Post, Daily Mail, Wall Street Journal, and Education Week. In the coming academic year, he will be an Associate Professor of Cognitive, Linguistic, and Psychological Sciences at Brown University. Dr. Akunafora, welcome to this 15th webinar of the 21, 21st Century California State Leaders Academy. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Should I just go from here? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to okay. share. Oh, sorry. What was it? Okay. 
Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Um, just going to jump right into it to hopefully allow for as much time to discuss and answer any questions as possible. Find that that's the best way to interact and to develop and grow uh, as a collective uh, with all the practitioners that we have here today. Uh, and so I'll be talking about something that I, my team have started to call sidelining bias, and that exists uh, in education, but also in another, a number of different domains or contexts. But today, I will be talking about it in the uh, field of education. But to start, just want to lay a foundation for where we are in, in, as it pertains to a scientific understanding of what bias is, how it functions, and what could potentially uh, be done about it. Uh, First, there was research done, I believe in 2008 or 2009, that came out in Science Magazine, one of the most rigorous scientific journals that we have across all of the sciences. And that just speaks to the rigor uh, of this experimentation uh, in which they showed participants brief clips, like just a few uh, seconds of popular TV shows that had been out at the time. I believe it was only shows that had been viewed by 10 million viewers or more each week. Um, and so things that people were regularly watching and just based on clips that they took from those shows with all of the audio removed, that was found to increase people's anti-black or pro-white implicit bias. Um, and so just to start there to understand what the sources of the bias are, but then also if we take a step back, understand just how often or, or frequently we get this exposure. And so if that was just brief clips with no sound, all we were seeing is nonverbal communication between a black person and a white person, for example, uh, and that just based on that and the depictions that many people watch on television, uh, it can have that type of change. But then that would also mean walking through a grocery store and seeing how people interact with each other or walk through an airport, not necessarily hearing uh, the exact exchanges that people are making, but just seeing uh, how those type of interactions play out in society. Well, those in and of themselves can be sources of implicit biases that we then carry with us. And so I wanted to start there so that we can have an honest understanding of what it is that we'll be up against if the objective was to do away with people's biases or de-bias them uh, in a way. Experimentation has been done at this point uh, over the course of the last decades enough that we can seriously take a look at what uh, has been effective, what hasn't been effective, um, and so there was a paper by Betsy Pollock that came out just a few years ago, I believe it was 2021, uh, that was a meta-analysis. And that's where you look at a lot of experiments that people have done and find what was the common finding across all of those studies. Uh, and so in her sample, I believe it was about 400 uh, experiments that they looked at uh, for, that were looking at how can one reduce prejudice or how can one reduce bias. And what was found was that the results were very mixed. Uh, and that there was a lot of instances well, uh, uh, that was about, well, it depends uh, if that will work or not. And there are instances where it could potentially backfire. Uh, to simplify that, uh, I want to show you a specific experiment. It's an intervention tournament. In this experiment, it was uh, similar uh, in that they were looking at how effective might different approaches be to try to get rid of people's biases. Uh, but they did it in a single tournament and pitted them against each other so that uh, we could look at it in that way. And here's a list of the different approaches uh, that they tried that were all based in previous research or theory uh, to be effective. These are also things that you might uh, see in regular trainings like implicit bias trainings or uh, DEI trainings that happen in workplaces, institutions, um, all over the world at this point. Uh, and you can see that a lot of them are intuitive, it seems like that should work, like raising awareness, for example. However, what was found in this tournament um, was that for the most part, uh, these approaches were not effective. And so on this scale, don't worry about all the dots and everything, I'm not gonna go too much into the statistical analyses, but just know I put in this red dotted line to show at that point, that's when we can understand that a reasonable amount of scientific certainty that it was indeed effective, that that approach was indeed able to reduce people's uh, anti-Black implicit bias as measured by the IAT. And most of those are not to the right of that red line. And even the ones that are to the right of that red line, it's not by very far. Uh, and in research, those uh, same researchers did a little bit later, they looked at how long 
did that effect last? And so even for those ones that were slightly effective at reducing anti-Black implicit bias, that anti-Black implicit bias came back not that long after, uh, somewhere between five minutes and 36 hours, I believe. Um, and so all of this to say, that's where we are from a scientific standpoint as it pertains to uh, where is this bias coming from, but also what where are we right now as it pertains to getting rid of it, debiasing people. And I wanted to present those uh, bodies of research uh, early uh, to just let it be clear that we should continue to look into ways that we can mitigate bias itself in ways that ultimately lead to inequities in real world outcome like school access uh, and access to learning. And where we are right now, it kind of makes sense that these type of approaches might not be as effective as we would like because what one is up against. And that's that part where people are regularly being inundated with more bias, more sources of bias. And so even if one successfully or effectively debiases uh, a group of people or, or someone, it's likely that that will just come back uh, uh, over time. And so I here to hopefully communicate and share that there is another way than just trying to de-bias people. Uh, and that that's what I'm gonna be talking about that uh, we're calling sidelining bias. But first, before even getting there, um, this new approach requires looking uh, at this uh, uh, inequity that's produced through a different way. Instead of focusing on the bias itself, the extent to which someone has anti fill in the group bias, but rather what are the consequences of that bias? And if we focus on the consequences of that bias, it might be possible that we can do something about the ultimate inequities while we're still taking time to figure out if things can be done about the bias itself. And I hope that'll make more sense as I proceed. Uh, and so to put it in a education context where we see the ultimate inequities, that would be access to education and how exclusionary discipline practices remove children from the learning environment. And then over the course of the last few decades, there's been an explosion in, in these types of uh, uh, disciplinary actions that remove children from the learning environment. Um, and they have become uh, for more subjective reasons or ambiguous. It's not children bringing guns to school uh, more so than before or bringing more drugs or things of that nature, but rather the increase in suspension seems to lie primarily in things that are more interpersonal, uh, things like insubordination or willful defiance or disrespect, things that if one were to ask 10 people what disrespect looks like, you might get eight different answers. And so that's what I mean by subjective. Uh, and I'll come back to that for, for, for why that matters. And so in addition to that overall increase in suspension rates, uh, there's also been detected uh, racial disparities in those suspension rates, as well as other disparities, which I'll come back to, namely the ones for students uh, with different abilities or who are eligible for special education. But to start here, uh, as it pertains to race, while black students make up about 40% of the student population in the United States, um, I'm sorry, they make up about 14% of the student population. While that's the case, they also represent about 40% of the students that are suspended in any given year. Uh, and so that type of disproportionality means that any given black child is facing something like three times more likely to be removed from class. And so there's different ways of thinking about why that might be the case. Some of them can have to do with things like stigma or culture or things that uh, are, are in the situation that cause that to play out behaviorally. And there's other hypotheses or theories that can have to do with, with things like bias coming into place and how uh, those students' behaviors are viewed. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to just go and focus on that bias part, uh, uh, similar to how we started in the context for today's conversation or to discussion. Um, and so in research I did when I was at Stanford, we looked at it, that exact thing. We recruited teachers from all over the country uh, to participate in an online discipline study in which we showed them a picture of a school and asked them to imagine themselves as a teacher at that school. Uh, we told them a little bit of information about the school so that all the teachers were thinking about similar things. We then showed them two instances of misbehavior by a student who had a stereotypically black name uh, or a student who had a stereotypically white name. And what we found is that by the time of that second 
uh, uh, incident, the second time the student misbehaved, student, I mean, teachers wanted uh, the student to receive uh, significantly more severe discipline if the student was black as compared to if the student was white. And so there we do see a what? We now have a causal path that just like anyone else, it's not just a teacher thing. Uh, teachers may be exposed to stereotypes that are in the air uh, and that ultimately what we see are differences in judging the exact same misbehaviors that depending on what is the race of the child that's doing it. Uh, and that also got us to, well, why is this happening? Is it indeed about these things that are existing in uh, society at large and their stereotypes, stereotypic associations that we have in our minds that ultimately lead to these disparities? To do that, we asked teachers the likelihood that they thought that student was a troublemaker, which is a stereotype about black boys uh, or black children and, uh, 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 across the board. And indeed, they were more likely to think the student was a troublemaker if the student was black as compared to if the student was white. And so with that, we put together statistical analyses, analyses to see, is this an overall process that seems to be playing out? And indeed, that's what we found. And what it was is that a student's blackness, as that increased, and it is, we did, we were able to measure that as a degree, uh, the, a student's blackness increased, so did their likelihood of a teacher wanting them or seeing them get suspended uh, down the road. And so that's a direct path between a student's race and the discipline that they'll receive. And if that's all the information we had, then the only options we'd have to do something about it would be those debiasing efforts to just try to get rid of people's biases and that that can ultimately uh, trickle to uh, there being more equity. However, by how this experiment was run, we were able to have more information that we can work with. And so what we found is that a student's blackness as that increased, so did the likelihood that the student would be labeled a troublemaker. And that in turn, the more any student was viewed as a troublemaker, the more a teacher would want that student to receive severe discipline or see that student being suspended in the future. And so that provides us with other options or opportunities but to, to potentially do something about the consequences of bias, the actual discipline, the suspensions. And that will be that part of the triangle that's going from troublemaker to suspension. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about when I talk about sidelining bias, doing something downstream that can effectively do something about the inequity and by that way, sidelining the bias completely. And so as an example of what I mean by sidelining bias, if you just think of a sports team, I know the uh, Super Bowl is coming up uh, and you have different players. And so if you imagine a person is a whole football team that consists of different selves or different goals, like a, a parent self or a professional self, that those are two different selves that do different things in any given situation. Well, if there's a part of oneself that will be problematic or get in the way of the objective of winning that game at that particular time, well, you sideline that player. And this approach, that's what the objective is, to sideline bias selves uh, in a way that uh, allows people to focus on what they were trying to do in the first place uh, without even uh, uh, having to go through processes of trying to reduce the bias itself. And so to put that differently, um, the standard, like I was explaining earlier in this experiment, is that we have these sources of bias that uh, uh, manifest or, or, or come through our minds in uh, uh, stereotypic associations that uh, are implicit and explicit biases that can play out at a systemic level uh, and things that are described as systemic biases, and also at an interpersonal level and just how people interact with each other. In turn, those two things increase the likelihood of Black children being viewed as troublemakers, for example, which contributes to the discipline disparities that we saw, and that that just builds over the course of entire school years or multiple school years. The other, or, or, or the debiasing approach or targeting bias directly uh, approach would look similar to that same uh, schematic. And the reason is, is because that dotted green arrow is getting at the part where there have only been found to be mixed effects or weak effects, such that ultimately bias would still ultimately lead to the disparities in discipline. The sidelining bias approach looks more downstream and thinks about things at an interpersonal level and at a structural level. At the interpersonal level, uh, it, it it's asking teachers to think more about how children are capable of growth and so having more of a growth mindset 
as opposed to a fixed one that would be this child is a troublemaker and will always be a troublemaker. No, it's possible that child's having a bad day and that this is an opportunity to get in there and discipline in a way that's productive, that that student can still feel respect in that relationship and grow from it. And, and understanding that there's that also growth potential in the relationship itself, that if there's conflict in the relationship, that doesn't mean that's a bad relationship and it's always gonna be a bad relationship, but rather that relationship can get better over time. And so these are things that would counter uh, that line that goes between, well, troublemaker, the only response is to respond in a punitive way, um, but rather opens up more of an empathic mindset is what we are coming to call it. And that that other part is the perspective getting part, the opportunity to actually learn more about a child and their perspective and why uh, they might be behaving in the way that they are, get more contextual information. Uh, and so opportunities that teachers can have to do that, but also when teachers get those opportunities that they uh, use them, those two things together, uh, the theory was is that that should improve disciplinary outcomes. And in experimental work, that is what was found. We tested it with teachers. When teachers had more of an empathic mindset, uh, participants in the student position were more motivated to behave well. And it acted through a similar type of process where the more empath, the more of an empathic mindset that the teacher had, the more respect that the student felt. And that in turn led students to want to behave better in the future. What does this look like? Ultimately, we put together a series of, we can call them professional development like workshops, workshops that were done in a scalable way because from the onset, we were looking at ways that this could be effective across large bodies uh, or across uh, entire cities or states. Uh, and so it was just essentially two online sessions that uh, teachers participated in. And then we collected suspension rates at the end of the year. This cut suspension rates by 50% across three school districts uh, here in California. And that's uh, some of what uh, Jabari was saying at the uh, introduction. Uh, and that that work allowed us to see that there is promise here. And here we're looking at the real world outcome. We're looking at actual year long suspension rates. And so it effectively did something about that outcome, but we still needed to know, does this effectively mitigate disparities in those outcomes? And so we ran this study again with a much larger sample uh, across several cities uh, and with a uh, sample that showed enough diversity that we could answer those questions. It also allowed us to ask additional questions, uh, like I alluded to before, that students who are eligible for special education might also be at a lack of receiving empathy and that they do face a higher rate of being removed from classrooms throughout the country. And what was found over the course of the year, uh, students of teachers who had this more empathic mindset uh, ultimately were less likely to get suspended. And that that was specifically or especially the case for the students who were most at risk of being suspended in the first place. And so that was the case for Black and Hispanic students. That was the case for students who have been suspended before in the past, but only once. It looks like, and we're looking into it, that if it's more than that, uh, that other uh, uh, supports would be needed to be put into place. And then as it pertained to students who are eligible for special education, it completely eradicated or did away with the disparity that they faced. And that interestingly, something that we're really excited about is that we were also able to follow up with these uh, students the year after uh, we had done this intervention. And if a student had a math teacher with more of an empathic mindset one year, they continued to be less likely to get into trouble uh, the following year. And that, that was the case across all students and also uh, as it pertained to mitigating or reducing uh, the gap in the discipline rates. And so, that's a lot of information. I said a lot. Uh, and so I want to stop here um, and hopefully be able to answer any questions that can further our understanding of all that information. Uh, thank you. We're going to come to the questions in just a minute. But before that, we want to introduce our practitioner panelists who've also uh, we're so excited to have them join us and participate in the discussion. I want to introduce them both. Uh, we have Dr. Kenya Williams. Uh, she's the principal of Culver City Middle School, and she has been an educational leader for over 12 years, serving in roles that range from a classroom teacher to an equity director for LAUS, LAUSD. And she's dedicated her career to promoting equity and access to the uh, school's work for all of the students in their respective communities. 
Also, we have Heraclio uh, Guevara, and he's the principal of Met Sacramento High School in Sacramento, California, and he served for over 20 years as an educational leader and administrator and is known for the successful implementation of his dual language program for native Spanish speakers, uh, successfully addressing disproportionate suspensions for black uh, uh, primary students in the uh, Sacramento area. Welcome, uh, Dr. Williams and uh, Principal Guevara. We'd like to begin with uh, a question that uh, will generate a little bit of the discussion in relationship to some of the considerations that Professor Okonofor has laid out. And that's how do you use data to support a responsive culture and climate in your school setting? Uh, Principal Guevara, do you want to go first? Uh, either way. Would you um, like me to go first or would you like to go? You could go ahead and if take If you it. wouldn't mind, that'd be awesome. Please. <laughs> Um, I first I want to say um, thank you all for having me. I'm having a problem with the dimmer. The light keeps going out. So if I have to go <laughs> and hit it, please uh, forgive me for that. But I cannot figure out how to make that work. But um, to to get back to the question as far as using data, I think ultimately, I think I look a lot at like the accountability systems. And sometimes when I'm looking at data, it may on, on its face look really, really great, right? Um, currently, I would say for Culver City Middle School, we have, we're in the green, you know, areas for mathematics in, in ELA. And I think if I were to look at it, um, you know, face value, it looks like, you know, we're doing a really great job. Uh, but I think the point of using data to improve, you know, the system is to dig a lot deeper into that data because there are a lot of other students, you know, in the school community and we have to always look at who is not being served. And I think that is how I, I try to use data. And so when I look at this, I'm looking at all of my students who come from historically marginalized groups. So I'm looking at my foster youth. I'm looking at our unhoused students. I'm looking at our black students. I'm looking at Latinx students, students, um, our ELD students, those students who we know historically um, have not been served in schools in general. And so I wanna know how those young people are doing because I think that that is how the data is, is, is powerful. And if on the surface, I'm doing a great job, but the majority of those young people who are most underserved are still struggling, then I have to kind of get back to the table with all of the other stakeholders and start to ask those tough questions, right? What is the equity issue here? And who is most disadvantaged with some of those decisions that we're making? And I think in addition, and I'll end with this, is that in starting with this like unified vision, I, I try to start every you know school year that way, any community that I go into, what is the unified vision? And so every decision that we make has to be aligned to that vision. And you have to use the data because you need to know is what we are doing achieving the outcomes we desire. And without the data, you really can't you know, identify that and make those adaptations should you need them. So I think that is maybe the, the way in which I look at data and how I, I utilize it. Thank you, Principal, Principal Guevara. Just call me Heraclio, please. Um, so thank you for starting the discussion, um, Dr. Kenya. Um, and thank you for having me and thank you for allowing me to be in this space with you all. Um, for myself, the way that I have utilized data with staff that I've worked with, um, I was invited here to discuss the work that I had done in South Sacramento, uh, um, an intermediate school where uh, many of our students, black and brown students, mainly uh, males, were being suspended. Um, and it was very difficult at first to um, have the staff understand um, the the need of 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 change of what we needed for our students. Um, and the way that I proceeded with that was making sure that we presented numbers as to who was not having access to um, an everyday education. Um, and the numbers obviously do not lie. Um, we could say I'm a great teacher. However, when we are not allowing our students to walk through our front door, what is it that we are doing to our students? And so 
one way that I began to bring in data to the staff was we would always have academic conferences uh, at the end of every trimester. And we would go over data as to how is it that we are doing in math, in ELA, in science, et cetera. And then from there, I began to bring in attendance. And then from there, I began to bring in um, referral submission. Um, and then from there, I was able to begin those discussions. At first, it was a very um, closed mindset as far as how is it that we could change what it is that we are practicing through within our classrooms and in the school. Um, at first, it was not well received at all. Um, you know, what Dr. Okonofua was mentioning of the the black the blackness of a student manifesting or a brownness of a student manifesting in a classroom was then viewed as a sign of disrespect of who we are of an educated person. Um, and, and so again, reiterating what the numbers were showing, um, I, I, it was only gone, those those numbers at first were viewed at the end of each trimester. And I felt that's not enough. We need to see it more often. And so I then began to put out a weekly newsletter for the staff, which I would with the upcoming dates and calendar items that are coming up. But then I also began to add by grade level, how many suspensions do we have and how many referral submissions do we have? And so little by little, you know, it was so nice to hear as, as the staff were saying, wait, I didn't submit any referrals and there's only five of us teaching in the fourth grade, but there's like eight referrals submitted. And so it was them then having that discussion because the numbers were not lying to them. And so them then being reflective of it and not me having to have these individualized conversations, even though they were being had, um, but them then leading those discussions. And, and it was just so, so nice to see the manifestation of the work that we're putting in place for our, our kids and our community, but then it changing the mindset of who we are as a staff and as a community. Um, it did take a few years to change that, but it continued year after year. And it was so nice to see where we would get zero referral submissions for the week um, from having teens or 20s of referrals submitted to zero. And like I said, the numbers didn't lie. It was um, it was great. From there, it was also brought up in our ELAC and our school site council. And so all of this was brought up. And now it's not just a discussion that Heraclio is having with you as a fourth grade teacher, as a sixth grade teacher, but it's parents also asking, um, and I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot or anything, but these are discussions that we should have. Um, not only is it, why is it that only X amount of students are meeting or exceeding standards in English or math, but why is it that we are not allowing our students to be in the classroom um, that they deserve to be in? So it was nice to show and lead the, the campus with with true data, raw data. Um, and a lot of it was with the support of um, my higher ups. Um, I would run all of these ideas always by someone who invited me here. And I just want to give a quick shout out to, to Mua. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here too. And um, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without your support. So thank you. Thank you both for those comprehensive answers to our first question. And in some ways you've already uh, anticipated and, and given an answer to what the, was going to be the second question. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the third question, uh, which uh, is connected to some of the considerations that uh, Professor Okunafor was laying out relative to these disproportionate and disparate uh, disciplinary rates. So what advice do you have for leaders to increase and cultivate more positive decision making surrounding student disciplinary measures? And uh, can we go ahead and begin with you, Dr. Williams? And, and I think you need your, uh, you're muted right now. Thank you. If I can piggyback on uh, what Eric Leo said, um, I think the, the conversations, you know, have to be had. And I think we have to acknowledge that we all have different perspectives and identity, you know, especially positionality is really critical to what those perspectives are and how we view people. And I think those are the difficult conversations that you, you have, but I think the courageous conversations are how you shift 
culture. Um, and I think in order to, to start having those conversations, that's when you get to understand those equity issues and you see it you know, happen. Um, I think the other things that you put into place is like developing that team. There's not a decision about student behavior uh, or student, you know, um, how we're going to deal with some sort of issue. The student is not necessarily meeting the expectations that we have. It's not a one person at the top that's making those decisions. It is a team of people and we have to sit there and we have to understand what steps have we taken before we even come to this, this, this point to really serve this young person before we just up and say, oh, well, we're going to, you know, suspend this student. We're going to expel the student. Like it, 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 there can't, it cannot be this one. Oh, that's the first thing you've done, or this is that. So you're, you're out of here. And I think having those people around the table and looking at the data and, and again, just bringing up what Eda Cleo said, like this, <laughs> you know, you, you have to be able to look at those numbers because they do not lie. And we can say that we're doing all of these things and we're being very equitable and we care about the outcomes of, of, of these young people. And then when you pull out the data and you look at it, it tells a completely different story. And I think having that at the center of those conversations and having multiple perspectives and people in the room and having to go around before you make those ultimate decisions, I think it does change it just shift culture and for now even for us there's there's no such thing as this is the first situation that's come up and now the student is being suspended you know what services do we have in place is this an issue to where they need a case manager right is this an issue because they are experiencing homelessness is this an issue that comes down to looking at students level as far as the reading and math and comprehension is this an issue that is coming up what are those things that we need to look at first to really serve this young person before we just up and say, oh, well, you need to be exited from this school community. And I think that's how I would look at it. And I'm going to turn on the light. Sorry. <laughs> and Principal Guevara, what advice um, do you have for leaders to increase uh, you know, a positive I, decision? I don't think there's a, um, a, a manual for this, right? It's I remember being asked this when I was a teacher, um, a math teacher at a local high school here in Sacramento. And I was asked, you know, how do you get your students to be at X amount of passing rate? Um, and teachers asking me that. And I think it's just um, personalizing yourself and making sure that um, you are very transparent with why you're trying to do this. I think even though sometimes we view some educators and we could be viewed as that as well, um, someone who just clocks in and clocks out. But at the end of the day, every single person wholeheartedly, when you get into education, it's because your heart leads you in that direction. Um, something that I did, and I'm not saying that this will work for everybody, um, but was opening the week with an opening circle with the staff and a closing circle. And we would, um, you know, when I first began to share the data that I was sharing earlier, um, I remember staff, some staff were upset that I was sharing their business, as they would say. Um, but they, I wanted them to begin to trust why I was doing this. Uh, and, and I wanted them to see, you know, my sincerity, um, why I cared for this new community that I just started to work in. And I get it, you know, you guys have been here for 11 years and, and I'm new to this school. Um, but I, I do remember starting just with the opening circle and, and it was really, um, obvious to see where those, the, the teachers that were submitting the referrals and, and not only asking, but demanding that, my kids be suspended and our kids be suspended. Um, we're not showing up to our opening circle. And I get it. It was after school. It was after we dismissed. I would create a circle at the, at the front of the school and we would open every week with um, what is what are you what's your outtake for the week? What is it that you want to look for? And sometimes it was personal. Sometimes it was something from the classroom. Sometimes it was I just want to make sure that I get eight hours of sleep. Um, and so we then as a staff would check up on each other to make sure that, hey, are you meeting your goals? And at the end of the week, it was a highlight where did you meet your goal or do you want to give kudos to somebody? And so it just created a community 
for for what we were doing and so i guess what i'm getting at is forming that community making sure that you trust the team it cannot be done by uh dr kenya williams and and only dr kenya williams it's got to be a team effort the community has to be in it the most beautiful part to that was as parents were coming up to pick up their kids and you know sometimes you have kids that are picked up a little bit later and so we would start our our circle and parents would say is this a meeting or is this something that I could jump in on? And it was nice to see our circle continue to grow and grow. Our kids would begin to jump in on it. Kids who had matriculated to seventh grade and on then would come back sometimes on Fridays and they would jump in and they wanted to be part of it. So it was something that the community then took on and, and there was trust. But the, what I wanted to get to is those teachers that were not showing up at first were then there. And it was so, it, it gives me chills still today because even though at first it was like, well, am I uh, able to participate? And it's like, get, get in here. Of course you are. This is for us. This is not for me. This is for us. Um, so it's it's really creating that center of healing for us because not we could have all these different degrees, but we still have to continue to grow as our educational system is growing. This system was not built for people who are on this screen right in front of me. It was not built for us. Um, although we do have to continue to restructure who we are. So it it's building that community of a safe space and a safe haven for our kids. Wow. I would like to um, ask a question that uh, we want to bring Professor Okonafor back. Uh, but there are a ton of questions coming in uh, for our panelists and for uh, Professor Okonafor. And I want to ask this question first for Professor Okonafor to answer from the standpoint of his research and then to have our practitioners join in with, from the perspective of their actual practice. And the question is, does the race of the teacher impact issues of bias? And in other words, can educators of color also be impacted by issues of bias? So if you could start us off with that, Professor Conifor, and a quick, you know, accentuation of that from your perspectives and practice, uh, site leaders, that would be wonderful. That's a great question. I'd actually like to hear from the people on the ground before I tell you what the research is. <laughs> yeah. But on this particular topic, uh, that's a great question, a question that scientists have looked into. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to have a great answer, but I will give you the, the best answer that we can speak at from a objective scientific standpoint. What that, it's a disclaimer, speculation. Um, from research that was done looking at shooter bias, which is bias that looks at the likelihood of shooting unarmed uh, black men is mostly what it looks at, but it does look at other stigmatized groups as well. Um, that research has shown that uh, anyone, police officer or not, black, white, whatever the race is, uh, while it differs a little bit, the overall trend or direction of the effects is that we're all more likely uh, to shoot a black uh, unarmed person uh, than a white unarmed person. Um, that's the closest I can give you to an answer on that particular thing. Uh, but differently in all of the research that I've done and the data that we've received, uh, I think we've done a good job of getting a representative sample, but that means I can't necessarily answer that question because that means most of the teachers in our sample, in our experimentation, are white and are women. And so there's not enough diversity there for us to say with a, uh, a lot of statistical certainty that it does matter. But I would remind everyone of the research on the sources of bias and that a more productive way that we're thinking about bias these days is that bias is in the air and we're all breathing the same air. We're all exposed to the same stimuli that's happening around us in the societies that we live in. Um, and I will say one more thing against speculation. It's my understanding and theorizing about our findings uh, that what might be different, and this is based on research that's not mine, but others on uh, match race teacher student relationships and it shows that there are benefits is that it seems like what might be the case is that from the default uh teachers of color or teachers that are of the same whatever the stigmatized identity is of a child uh have more experience to use to empathize with the child if that makes sense like it's not 
difficult for them to see and understand what a child is going through before asking the child what they're going through. And so that's still asset based. So, so the teachers that uh, aren't of the same race or background of their students, it does, I would suggest, well, yeah, you might want to do more to ask more questions, to, to, to be more open to hearing about stories that aren't your own. And then that's where the difference might be, but that we all have the biases though. Um, and so, yeah, sorry, that, I hope that that helps. It does help, and for our site leaders, can you each give us your elevator pitch on uh, how you experientially understand this possibility that educators of color can be impacted by these issues of bias also? Well, I think for myself, if I'm if thinking about history, I think that um, when we think about the way that white supremacy operates in many ways, I think in, in the context of like anti-blackness, it's definitely going to be absorbed into the into your own community. I think that's just part of it. We consider, you know, respectability politics, all of these things that that run into the way that we see ourselves and those messages that we've all received from the time that we come into the world and moving forward. So I think that it's important for us to 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 acknowledge that regardless of ethnicity, bias is a part of it. And it may not necessarily be bias because of, towards another student that is of the same ethnicity, but it could be biased towards students in special education, biased towards students with disabilities, right? There's so many ways in which we look at bias. So I think it's important for us to not stop at this idea of ethnicity and, and assume, oh, these students in a predominantly black or predominantly Latin X with teachers of the same ethnicity are not going to have any biases towards these students because there's so many things that make up culture, our own experiences and positionality that make us look at other people that may physically or complexion wise look like us, but from many different ways in which we've all been socialized, we see them very differently. So I think those conversations around bias have to be had because there are biases that some of us have currently and we don't even know we have until those situational um, you know, experiences come into play. So I think that's what I would say and I'm just gonna be <laughs> quiet because I think I'm going too long, but that's my, my thoughts. This was the Sears Tower elevator, so no problem. Uh, for Principal Guevara, what's um, your thought? I I think it does play into it. Um, you know, I think our upbringing has a lot to do with how we um, treat youngers who are be, being up in, in, in that same space of upbringing. Um, we tend to try to bring the youth up as we were brought up. And so the, I, what I have seen um, with folks that I work with is the expectations of, of, of what a child or a, a young person should work on and, and, and um, produce is, is that's our expectation. And that's where I see a lot of the disciplinary coming in and shooting down on our, on our kids, um, black and brown kids specifically in, in, my, in my experience. So I do think that it ha what I have seen, I don't have scientific proof background to prove it, but what I have seen definitely, um, the, 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 what I did notice was um, the white educators that I did work with um, that were, <laughs> that submitted the most amount of, of referrals or expected a consequence over someone telling them to, shut up or shut the F up. Um, if they were, two of them were were tied to um, to a law enforcement, they were married to a law enforcement um, official. Uh, they, it was very different. That's why I feel depending upon your surrounding and depending upon your upbringing, it really has a lot to do with it. And I, I hate to say like, you know, I'm interviewing you and, and it looks like you're, um, living from a specific background but it's it's it really has a lot to do with how we work with youth mm. yeah yeah Matt, yeah so really quickly just a really quick example i think pulls together similar things that the site leaders were talking about it's a personal thing so i'm from memphis tennessee uh but in high school i got a full scholarship to go to a elite prep school on an island off the coast of rhode island 
And when I think about the teacher that knew me the best and had the greatest impact on me, it wasn't the black teacher at that elite prep school. It was a white teacher in the South who understood things like the culture I was raised in and like how what respect looks like, uh, what, what, what situations are that we face that you need to look at someone in the eye and say hello when they're walking past you, the little things. And it's like, yeah, I don't think it's a black and white thing in ways that people might imagine, but those things do play a role as well. Thank you uh, for, for, for making that synthesis between what our, our practitioners were saying. I'm going to ask this question to you, uh, Professor Okanafora, just in, in terms of the time we have left. Central to your argument is this development of an empathetic mindset. And also notice in your reducing implicit bias interventions that you said weren't necessarily working. Interesting ones there, like multiculturalism and other kind of things. But one was training empathetic responding as one of the things that wasn't necessarily working that well. So talk, close us out by helping us understand how a person at the site level can really work to uh, facilitate the development of an empathetic mindset with the uh, people that they're uh, trying to guide and lead in the, in the, in the context of uh, changing these conditions for our students. Great. Um... I think there were two parts of it. The first part is that it's pretty straightforward that the seeming like uh, contradiction between the interventions um, that I showed that were not effective, and one of them totally had to do with perspective taking or empathy. Uh, and then there's the program that I have that, or my, the approach that the, uh, my team and I have found to work really effectively being empathy. The difference is what was one measuring? is a main difference. And so for that intervention tournament, the perspective getting, it wasn't effective at getting rid of people's biases. My work, which is similarities, the focus is on not bias, but what does this do about equity things? What does this do about the actual outcomes of interest? Um, and a, a, a way of thinking about that I think would be useful is that well, first of all, there's a common misconception between sympathy and empathy, and we're very specifically talking about empathy. Sympathy is imagining what you would do if you were someone else uh, or if you were in their shoes. Empathy is fully thinking about where did they get these shoes from in the first place? How many shoe stores are in their neighborhood? How long have they walked in these shoes? How many different shoes do they have in their closet? Really finding out more perspective is something that it needs to happen to indeed empathize with a child. And the reason why I believe, a reason why uh, that's effective is that it's communicating respect to children uh, that, that, that may be righteously or not righteously scared that they're gonna be treated unfairly at school. And so showing them that you actually are interested in who they are as a person beyond some statistic, beyond some stereotype, that does work in and of itself for that child. And then for the teacher, um, you are then able to get more information that can allow you to effectively respond to the misbehavior, such that punishment or sending them to the office is not the only option, and in many cases is not the useful option. The productive option would be having a conversation with them, but you would already need to have that type of rapport, that type of trust that builds over time. And that I think, and the site leaders, I hope there's time for them to provide feedback on this as well, because I'm a scientist. They're out there on the front lines actually engaging with these people, um, engaging with the people that are interacting with all of these children. Um, the teachers joined the profession because they wanted to help children become their best possible selves. In interviews with hundreds of teachers, that's pretty much the same. They did it. It's not some other field of work where they joined it because they wanted to get rich. They joined it because they're some of the most empathetic people we have in society. They do it for the culture, however we put it. It's a matter of, I think, where you unite those things is that reminding teachers of why they became teachers in the first place, putting it in that context, letting that be what the conversation is about, not pointing fingers at like, you're doing this wrong, you're racist this, you're sexist that, but more so asset-based. You join this profession to help all children learn, grow, and be their possible selves, like the site leaders were saying, and then you show them the data, and the more you can do it, the better. And it's like, this is what the data is showing. And so it looks okay. like nationally, the students that can use our support the most are not getting it. 
So what can we do about that here? And that yeah. sets up a situation where you're, you're productively doing something to bring about equity and not needing to get lost in conversations that need to be had in other situations about, you yeah. know, what the bias is, how it's like doing this or certain people show more bias or not. There's a difference between yeah. getting the job done and looking like or feeling like one is getting the job done. And I think iterative place. processes of providing data and conversations that are done in a productive and so pro-social and asset-based way, like you're looking for the best in your teachers because there is a best in your teachers. That's why they're coming to school every day. I know the educators know what I'm talking about, but um, yeah, that, that's what I was saying. Okay, well, these uh, amazing insights, this cross-section of insights from our amazing uh, accomplished professor and these amazing uh, site leaders is where we're gonna have to leave it today. I think it's leaving it at a really great point. I wanna thank you so much for uh, joining this conversation. And I think it was a great dialogue. We're gonna see all kinds of utility for this webinar in the actual training of leaders uh, in the future. And I wanna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca Chung to uh, close us out with a few announcements. Well, thank you again. Thank you to Professor Khan Fu and our panelists. Thank you to our participants who took time out of their busy schedule to be here today. This webinar will be recorded and archived on our website. We're dropping the link to the website in the chat. And also we have a newsletter. So if you're interested in future uh, webinars, you're welcome to join us. Thanks again. Have a great week.